So I just started the recording. And um, let's just start with the moment of prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord, um, we place our care in your hands. We place our salvation in your hands. We place our safety and our loved ones in your hands. And um, we just know that you care so much for us that you died for us on the cross. So whatever happens with this COVID nonsense, just keep us close to you. And uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I couldn't think of anything else to say. Hi, Karen. Everybody, that's Karen down there. Karen, Hi, Karen. I think you know everybody except maybe Terry and Sally Silva. Right. Who are joining us from our Bible study. So we are recording this. Um, anybody have any announcements before we get started? Well, we, we're going to have a new Bible study starting. Oh, yes. And tell us, tell us the about interesting that. thing is that I realized, because I, I lecture and I was looking over what I'm going to be reading tomorrow and so forth, and discovered that all this week, the Old Testament reading is going to be from the book of Hosea. And that is the first prophet we're going to be doing in the class. Oh, good. So, you know, it's so interesting how as you learn these bits and pieces in classes, suddenly um, things show up for you differently. Yeah. Like yeah. that wouldn't have a whole lot of meaning for me, except, oh, wait, I'm teaching that class and it's going to be the first class that we do. How cool. You know? Are you going to send out the information for the uh, class? Yeah, we will. It, it's still a little bit early. You know, so okay. I, I'd be happy if we could finish this study and then get the publicity out for the next well, one. Because I, I, I could always sneak the access information to anybody who wanted to register early and order the book. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And you, you, Terry and Sally, are, or at least Terry, are already leader for that yeah. Bible study. So you go ahead and do what you want, but the information will go out to the parish a little bit later. Yeah, I would, one I thing I'm to you. Send me the email on the slide. <laughs> okay, we, we will do this on, on the sneak. Yes. So let me ask you guys if you could mute yourselves because I, I'm hearing a lot of scratching background noise. And there will be a couple of times where we're going to unmute and break out into breakout rooms um, briefly. But for now, let's just mute yourself and I will share my screen. And I have to admit that this was not an easy lesson to prepare. I can't share my screen because I don't have my screen ready. Let me get that out of the way. Okay, now I can share my screen. Um, you know, sometimes in RCIA we have these lovely touchy-feely kind of lessons where we're doing a lot of sharing and you know the answers are very cut and dry and this was not one of those this is one that had a lot of theology to it so please feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question if you need to can everyone see the title slide or if you can't unmute yourself and tell me so the the topic that Abraham wanted to know about was why did Jesus have to leave? So that I thought that's a great question. I never really thought it through before. Um, and so it, I think what it will help us if we can think of this whole topic in terms of spiritual physics. So we know that in physics, there are certain laws and that govern how matter and energy behave. This is in regular physics. And keep in mind, I have not studied this since high school. So this is my simplified version. You know about gravity because you know if you drop an apple, it falls to the ground, right? And people have known this for a couple of centuries. We didn't know what it was called, but we knew that there was a force acting in the universe that caused things to drop to the ground if you let go of them. And we've learned about light and energy, that light behaves as both a particle and a wave. And we've learned more about matter in, uh, the, I guess, the 20th century with Einstein proving that matter is neither created nor destroyed. So there are certain laws that govern physics, the physical world. And we accept these physical laws, not necessarily because we know the math behind them, 
but because we see their effect in action. So we see an apple tree with a bunch of apples on the ground. Spiritual physics is very similar to that. So spiritual physics governs the relationship between humans and one another and humans and God. So here are some of the principles that you could say belong to our spiritual physics. We were created to be in perfect union with God. He gave us free will and we chose to disobey him and failed to trust him and be obedient to the relationship that he established with us. So as a consequence, all humans are born with a tendency to be sinful, or you know, they are born with original sin, we say. That's not personal sin, it's just a tendency we have because we are human beings that we will sin. Every human being has sinned except one, and that's Jesus Christ. So how do we know this? Well, we can see the effects of sinfulness in the everyday world, that's very easy to see. But we also know this from the story in Genesis in the Bible about Adam and Eve. Now the story of Adam and Eve is not a historical story. There was nobody there writing down what happened to Adam and Eve. But people, human beings, saw the effects of sin in the world and they thought, I wonder how that could have happened. And so in consultation with God, they wrote a, a story that explained the spiritual physics behind sin and disobedience and the consequences of sin. So when we sin, we know that causes certain consequences. It causes broken relationships. It brings out punishment and it even results in death. And here's just a kind of a random listing of sins. Murder obviously results in death, in the death of the person who's been killed as well as maybe the spiritual death of the person who did the, the murder. Um, unfaithfulness is another one. When you have betrayed someone in a relationship, that really breaks the relationship and it takes a great deal of forgiveness and grace and, um, and love to get that relationship restored or reconciled. Um, even things like just leaving God out of your life if you live a, a totally um, secular life without keeping God in the equation, there are going to be consequences to that. Consequences of broken relationship with God, as well as some kind of punishment and death. So one of the underlying big principles of spiritual physics is that we are all guilty of sin and we all deserve punishment. That is that result of the original sin that we all carry as human beings, I guess you would say, in our DNA. But we also know that God loves us so much, he found a way to reunite us to himself and to take away the punishment that we deserve. And that's what we call salvation. So as sinful humans, we need salvation to be united with God. Now, salvation is not anything that we can accomplish. There is nothing that we can do to earn salvation. No matter how good we try to be, that is not how we are saved. We can only be saved through the saving action of Jesus Christ, what he did for us to make up for our sinfulness. And we know this from scripture, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. So right there it tells you the principle of the spiritual physics here is that God sent his son to have the effect that we might have eternal life. So now we're going to go um, kind of look through the sequence of Jesus. And remember going back to that, uh, that principle of, you know, well, why did why did God choose to send Jesus? Why didn't he just snap his fingers and say, okay, Adam and Eve, I forgive you. But that would have been contrary to our nature as human beings because God created us with free will. So we are free to make our choices and because we're human, we are going to choose to sin. So this is God's remedy for that. So Jesus came, he was born, he was born fully human and fully divine. 
and he lived a relatively quiet life until the age of 30. Then at the age of 30, he started his public ministry. So for about three years, he went around proclaiming the good news that he was the Savior, the Messiah, that the Jewish people, who are God's chosen people, um, had expected for thousands of years. And Jesus lived a life of complete love and mercy. And here's Eric. Let me let him in. Uh, love and mercy and healing and teaching. And uh, if you have any doubts about that, we're doing a wonderful Bible study right now of the, uh, the Gospel of John. And one of the stories that comes to mind is the woman caught in adultery. And Jesus did not condemn her, but he forgave her. He showed love to her. He showed mercy to her. And he even offered her a restored relationship and saved her from the wrath of all of the uh, people who were trying to trap Jesus into um, doing something that would give them reason to kill him. So in spite of the fact that he was in a very tenuous situation himself, Jesus reached out and showed love to a woman who was sinning. We also know that Jesus gathered a relatively small group of, of uh, disciples around him. He was their rabbi, and we know he had 12 disciples to begin with. Now, after about three years, he was seen as a threat to the establishment, both the, um, the Jewish establishment, you know, the elders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they, they saw him as a threat to the way things were done. And the Romans were also having problems with him too. So at that time, his own people betrayed him and handed him over to be killed. What did he do? Did he condemn them all? No, he didn't even resist. And he even, as he hung on the cross, forgave those who killed him. So he died on the cross and was buried. I know most of you know this whole story, but it's important to see it in the sequence that it happened. Now, before he died in the Gospel of John, we hear some words that are going to take us into that why, the why of why Jesus had to leave. So Jesus prayed to the Father for his followers before he died. And he said, as you sent me into the world, so I sent them into the world. Who is he talking about? Who is them? Those are his disciples. And then he continues to pray and says, I pray not only for them, the disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So who is it that believes in Jesus because of the word and the witness of his disciples and followers? Well, 2,000 years later, that's us, right? We are the ones who believe. Jesus, before his death, was even thinking about us 2,000 years later. And why does he care about us? He goes on to say, so that they may all be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. That they, that means us, also may be in us that the world may believe that you sent me. So there you get kind of a complicated, but not really, you know, explanation of Jesus is concerned about us. We haven't even been born yet, but he wants to set things up so that we have the opportunity to believe in him and to be one with the Father, just as Jesus is one with the Father. And so we go back, and there was the crucifixion, and Jesus was really and truly dead. Roman crucifixions were, were not, you know, easy things. They were very brutal, and they were absolutely sure he died. So he was put in a tomb, and after three days, his friends went to anoint his body, but they found he wasn't there. He had risen. So Jesus appeared several times to people after the resurrection. And I just want to point out, I've, I've um, you know, there are examples of people being raised from the dead, like Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead. So resurrection was not unknown, but raising yourself from the dead was completely unknown to the Jews. So the early followers completely believed that Jesus had risen because he was God. In their minds, there could be no other explanation. That had to be it. This is the account from the Gospel of Luke about the resurrection. At daybreak on the first day of the week, they took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. 
they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were puzzling over this, behold, two men in dazzling garments appeared to them. And in this picture, you'll see that Jesus is flanked by angels. So, you know, we don't know who the two men were. They could have been angels. They, meaning the women, were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. They said to them, why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but has been raised. Remember what he said to you while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and rise on the third day? And they, meaning the women disciples, remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and announced all these things to the eleven and to all the others. So they went back to the 12 disciples, that was now the 11 disciples, because Judas had betrayed Jesus, and they announced all this stuff. Can you imagine what the disciples were thinking? Like, what? How can this be? Now, we know that he rose from the dead, not just because the angels said something to the women, but because he actually appeared in his resurrection glorified body several times after the resurrection. Jesus appeared to his, uh, his followers and offered them peace. He gave them authority and power to act in his name, the power to heal, teach, forgive, and proclaim. And now we go back to that question, the question of the evening. Why did he choose to do it this way? So here in the Gospel of John, Jesus tells you, but I tell you the truth, it is better for you that I go. Remember, this is, he's in his resurrected state, but he's still walking around on earth. It is better for you that I go. For if I do not go, the advocate will not come to you. Now, who is this advocate? I, you don't have to unmute yourselves. I'll tell you. The advocate is another name for the Holy Spirit. So Jesus himself says, if I don't go, the Holy Spirit will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Um, he had referred to this advocate earlier in the Gospel of John in chapter 17 as well. And so 40 days after Easter, we have an event called the Ascension. And this is where, you know, when you say, why did Jesus leave? This is what I think of. Why did he leave? Why did he ascend? Why did he go back to the Father? Why didn't he just stay and walk around on earth? Well, we all already know that Jesus had to leave because it's better for us that he left. It meant that he could send the Spirit. It meant that it gave us the possibility to be united with the Father. So let's explore this a little more. So after he had been on earth in his glorified state for 40 days, Jesus ascended into heaven. His disciples witnessed this. So the disciples actually saw this happen. Then the Lord Jesus, after he spoke to them, was taken up into heaven and took his seat at the right hand of God. Um, I would recommend you read or watch Bishop Barron's video. It's a short video, I think seven minutes long, about the ascension. He says it better than I can, but the basics is that Jesus, his body was in a glorified state and it needed to be completely united to the Father. So it could not just walk around on the earth in a glorified state. It had to be fully and completely united to his father. Another clue as to why Jesus left is in the Gospel of John. In my father's house, there are many dwelling places. Now, where is my father's house? That means heaven. If there were not, would I have told you that I am going to pre prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back again and take you to myself, so that where I am, you may also be. So it seems that Jesus had to leave to prepare a place for us. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask you, so you can start thinking about this, and we'll go into our breakout rooms in a minute. But um, the, another reason why Jesus had to leave was to intercede for us, to pray for us. And the, uh, the, the epistle to the Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews says, therefore he, Jesus, 
is always able to save those who approach God through him, since he lives forever to make intercession for them, in other words, us. For Christ did not enter into a sanctuary made by hands, a copy of the true one, but heaven itself, that he might now appear before God on our behalf. So I think it helps to think of where Jesus went, not so much as a place like the planet Mars or the moon, but a state of total unity with the Father. And in that place, he intercedes for us. So our breakout room question is, what do you imagine Jesus does to intercede for you before the Father? I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. And I think we'll do just, um, We'll do three rooms, I think. Oh, hello, Eric. I see you have joined us. Um, Eric, can you start your audio so we can hear you? I'm sending you a request to unmute. Everybody else, unmute yourself. Abraham, unmute yourself. Karen, unmute yourself. And Kristen, unmute yourself. Okay, great. We're all unmuted. So um, stop the recording. Or Hello. Hi. Back from our breakout rooms. My group had a really good discussion. I didn't necessarily want us to share. Let me admit Abraham. He got up. <laughs> Abraham was we, having video. We lost Abraham. There, there he is. is. There there is. is. So uh, I hope you all had at least two people in your groups. And um, is there, does anybody want to say anything about your discussion? If not, we'll go back to the presentation. I think, I think I'll speak up and break the ice a bit. Oh, hi, Eric. Howdy. Uh, in our group, we were talking about uh, that what we want uh, Jesus Christ to intercede with in our lives in our lives may not always be what we need, and it, how we may not be looking at it from the same perspective that the Lord is. Great insight. Very good. Oh, more people are joining. Look at this. <laughs> okay, I don't know who just joined. Who is that? It's me, Abraham. Oh, very good. Okay, I'm just going to put your name on that. So you figured it out. Great. Okay. Would anybody else like to say what they discussed okay. in the breakout room? Okay, what... Um I, but I, I w was, was looking at where in, uh, in John 12, when, when they say, uh, we, we thought the Messiah would stay with us forever. And, and he's saying, uh, no, I'll just be here for a little while. So essentially he's saying, uh, absorb as much as you can. Absorb as much of the light as you can because the dark is coming and you'll need to be the light in the darkness and so forth. And that he had, that when, he didn't, he did, didn't just abandon us. He created um, Peter and the disciples. So essentially as the Pope and the, the Pope and the bishops, mm -hmm. I, he, so he, so, so he, so he created this and then he sent the holy spirit and after pentecost when the holy spirit had descended upon the disciples mm -hmm. suddenly they had enormous power yeah. they went from hiding in the upper room one day to being out in the middle of the middle of town the next baptizing three thousand people fearlessly well now you're giving the whole second part of my presentation Christine. sorry <laughs> uh, we'll talk anymore. <laughs> no, that's okay. Any, but does anybody else have something that they feel like they want Jesus to intercede for them personally? I think I like that. I saw that Bishop Barron thing. I watched it. And I like his, and I won't. I'll paraphrase it and do it no justice, I'm sure. But that he's not just, it's not going to a faraway place that we have to go sometime. It's a unification that he's bringing the kingdom of god closer to earth to us in our existence mm -hmm. not further away and that sounded nice to me yeah. mm. okay great well let's just continue with the presentation if you're ready 
Um, I'll invite you to mute yourselves again. Yeah. Okay, so we did our breakout room. And let's go to the next slide. So um, in my research, I, I came across some teaching from St. Thomas Aquinas, who I um, can't remember if I told you this before, lived in the 1300s, so right in the Middle Ages, and was probably the greatest theologian of the Catholic Church. And he addressed this question of why Jesus had to leave. And he said uh, that it's to help us, all of these generations after Jesus, to increase our faith, our hope, and our charity, those three virtues, the three cardinal virtues. So he quotes John 20, have you come to believe because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. So this is what we call faith, when we believe something that we haven't necessarily personally seen with our eyes. We believe it because somebody else tells us about it or we have an experience of it. And of course, we're kind of all in that boat with Jesus. Uh, maybe we believe it because the faith is passed down from parent to child. Those are all ways of receiving the faith. It also, Jesus leaving, also promotes hope. Since Christ has gone to the place, he has promised for those who remain faithful. So he's going to prepare a place for us. So it increases our hope that there is something after death, that Jesus has reunited with the Father, and that we will share in that union too when we die. And it promotes charity, which is another word for love, since it is from his place in heaven that Christ sends us the Holy Spirit and the fire of his love, urging us to the love of God and neighbor. And we are going to explore, as Kristen hinted at, a little bit more about this Holy Spirit thing. Now, by his resurrection, Christ entered upon an immortal an incorruptible life. Here again is a quote from Thomas Aquinas. But whereas our dwelling place is one of generation and corruption, in other words, where we live is one where people live and, are, and die, the heavenly place is one of incorruption. And consequently, it was not fitting that Christ should remain upon earth after the resurrection, but it was fitting that he should ascend to heaven. So I think all of these quotes are like little clues, you know? There's nothing written down that says, oh yeah, here's why Jesus had to ascend. It's like you get a clue from scripture, a clue from Thomas Aquinas, and you put them all together and you start to understand. So I think why questions are really hard to answer because why questions are asking what was in God's mind? And you know, ultimately it's hard to say what was in God's mind. But we do know that Jesus made the perfect atoning sacrifice so we can live without punishment. We know that he restored our relationship of love with God that was lost through original sin. We know that he opened the way for us to share eternal life after we die. And he created a way for all generations to know and follow Jesus, even after he is united with his Father in heaven. And I think if you think of historical figures that you know and admire, like, you know, George Washington or something like that, you know, yeah, we, we know what he did and we admire what he did, but what he did was in the past and it kind of remains in the past. Whereas what Jesus did is still happening in the present because of the way he chose to leave us and then return to us. So Jesus was now in a glorified state and returned to his father. And we, the disciples back then, were not united with the father yet. And we aren't united with the father even now. So in order for us to be united with the father, Jesus must come to us through the Holy Spirit. And so this whole process, I've been talking about it as physics, but the actual term that the church uses, the theological term, is the economy of salvation. So the economy of salvation, and this is from the Catholic Catechism, refers to God's activity in creating and governing the world, particularly to his plan for the salvation of the world in the person of Jesus Christ, a plan which is being accomplished through his body, the church. 
in its life and sacraments. So if you think about what we've talked about, there's sort of a continuum. You know, there's this life of Jesus that happened when he walked on earth, his passion, death, resurrection, ascension, and the coming of the Spirit then establishes his presence in the world through the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ, which lives in the church with its life and sacraments. So 50 days after Easter on Pentecost, Jesus sent his Holy Spirit to his followers. They received the Holy Spirit and were changed forever. So they were in the upper room, shaking in fear. The door was locked. And suddenly there was a wind and tongues of fire appeared on them. And they were filled with this Holy Spirit. And now we call that day of Pentecost the birthday of the church. Because before that, they were just disciples. But after that, they took up their responsibility to go out and be church to the world. So their commission was to go baptize all nations and share the good news. So the church is now the body of Christ. All right. And there's a couple of ways that we think of the body of Christ in the Catholic Church. It's baptized Catholics. Okay. That's part of who we know as the body of Christ. It's people who are living, followers of Christ who are living, and followers of Christ who have died. So that communion of saints is also part of that body of Christ. And we also consider the Holy Eucharist, the bread that has been transformed into Jesus, body and blood, soul, and divinity, that is also known as the body of Christ. So there are different parts of the body of Christ that make up that term, the body of Christ. So Christ is with us always on earth, supernaturally. His presence is seen in the many workings of the Holy Spirit manifest in the church and also in a tangible way in the Holy Eucharist. So um, I'm not going to do breakout rooms, but I'm going to stop sharing and, and we can talk a little bit about where have you seen the work of Christ in the world or in the church or in the sacraments and um, this is very helpful, I think, for those of you um, who maybe are not Christian or, you know, have never heard of this concept before, to just hear Christian people articulate how do they experience the body of Christ? Where do, you know, what does that look like? What does it feel like? So would anybody like to share? And don't forget, you're muted. I think in worship, when the manner of worship, when you go in, I, I just feel a presence. I can't really, you know, I feel we are together, the body of Christ, and there's a unity in that that is transforming. Absolutely. I, I was going to say prayer. When, when people assemble in a community and worship and pray together, we are the body of Christ. Yeah. We, we are Christ worshiping God seeking that union with the Father that Jesus knew. And when we receive the actual sacrament of communion, even more so. That's kind of like the apex of that worship experience. Thank you. Well, when we're singing, um, definitely we're praying twice, they say. So that's, uh, we're definitely a community there. Yes, yeah. And it really, it's such an emotional feeling, you know. I mean, it's emotional for me listening to the choir sing. Oh, I miss it so much. But <laughs> I can imagine being in the choir and making these glorious sounds and just feeling like, you know, you couldn't do that with just a soloist. You have to have the whole choir there to experience that body. Mm -hmm. Cool. Anything else? I was, um, maybe I didn't quite hear the question right, but I would... What came to my mind instantly after you said that was that we see this in people who amazingly become capable of things that you would not think they would be capable of. And what instantly came to my mind was Mother Teresa. Yeah. That, that, that people just uh, do amazing things um, and I was reading today in John about the good shepherd laying down his life for the, giving his life for the sheep, and it finally occurred to me: wait a minute, 
It's, it's sort of take, taken me years to say, like, oh, wait a minute, he's not saying the good shepherd needs to die for the sheep. I mean, who's going to get them home? That <laughs> it's when you give up your life for it. But that's like Mother Teresa. She uh, laid down her life for us and, and so many great people that, yes. uh, and that's not natural. It's not what they learned at home. It's, it is, it is something. Um, it really is something supernatural, isn't it? It is supernatural, yes. In that's the right. sense that she was filled with the Holy Spirit. She listened and heard God's call that said, stop teaching school to these, you know, wealthy Indian girls. And I want you to go serve the poorest of the poor because that's where I, Jesus, am. And what she, a difficult decision. She went around town to getting contributions and things from people. And she truly, not in her own city, you know, she's in India. She's not in <laughs> where she was raised. And here's this little woman just will not take no for an answer, showing up and getting the contributions and getting the help. That, um, that uh, those of us who, are, who um, really don't want to make a phone call unless <laughs> we really have to, and then we see somebody who would just go b barging into some large company and, and unannounced, no, <laughs> no appointment and say, I'm, do, I'm doing this project and I need this from you, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that, that Holy Spirit, uh, uh, people have different personalities. So, you know, being assertive may not be the Holy Spirit. It depends on whether it, the effect of that is love or not love. <laughs> so, you know, some of that is personality differences. But you, I think the Mother Teresa example is excellent. It's like... In day-to-day -day life, we don't see a whole lot of Mother Teresa, so they really stand out. And how one person who's filled with the Holy Spirit, who really gives her life to, to Christ and being Christ to others, can absolutely change the world. So imagine those 12 disciples and all the women and, and the original people who knew Jesus being that empowered. No wonder the church built up and survived. All right, should we go back to the presentation? Can I add one thing? Because yes. her, she was talking about the choir, and I've yep. sung in choirs, and one of the real pleasures for me of singing in a choir is harmony. And the fact that when our voices blend, harmony is a very real and physical thing. And I think spiritually we can have harmony too when we're together. And I think it's easier to know when harmony's gone than when it's there sometimes, like in the times when I turn on my news now. Um, I think harmony is such a blessing to know. Yeah, yeah, agreed. And um, that's a great metaphor, too, for the body of Christ, because not everybody is singing the same note, but they're all contributing to the unity and the beauty of what's produced. Yeah, it's harmony. Yeah. Anything else? Okay, let's go back to the screen. If you if you want to, you can mute yourself. I don't think we have too much more to go. Okay, so we've established that the coming of the Holy Spirit, you know, Jesus had to leave so he could send the Holy Spirit. And the coming of the Holy Spirit established the church. In other words, the community of believers who believe in Jesus and who accept his Holy Spirit. So how is that played out today? Well, in the Catholic Church, the two sacraments that speak very strongly of the Holy Spirit are baptism and confirmation. So the church explains the Holy Spirit as being poured out on us at baptism and at our confirmation. The Spirit is thrown upon us and given to us as a way to experience God in mind, heart, and body. So it is because we receive, accept, and live in the grace of the Holy Spirit that we experience God in a new way. It's not necessarily automatic. You might have to be taught 
what this means. You might have to hang out with other Christians. And I, I think we talked about that last week in the discipleship talk, you know, how important it is to apprentice yourself to other Christians to really learn what it means to be a Christian. And here we see from the Gospel of John that Jesus is stating that the main purpose of the Holy Spirit is to enable the disciples and us to realize that you are in me and I am in you. That intimacy and that union that uh, we experience with Jesus is through the Holy Spirit. So this is the last slide, I promise. It's now our responsibility to be Christ to the world and to bring Christ to the world. And I just thought these are the spiritual physics of how God chose to bring us salvation and lead us to our eternal home and union with him in heaven. So I hope that was kind of a, a roundabout way of saying why did Jesus have to leave? Um, do you guys have anything to add to that? Anything that I might have missed or another scripture verse that plays into that? I want to thank Abraham for asking for this because it troubles me too. Good. So I, might, I might not have asked, but I'm glad he did. So thank you, Abraham. I know he's out there somewhere. He is. He's on the phone. He can hear us. Okay. Yeah, and really that's what RCIA should be. It should be a time yeah. for people to say, I don't get yeah. this. You know, explain it to me. I, yeah. I, I hope you got something from that. I hope it wasn't too roundabout. Yeah. Good. You know, the thing that comes to my mind is that, you know, why did Jesus have to leave? I think, you know, God is saying, look, I sent my only son to die for your sins. He not only died for your sins, but he taught you what was supposed to happen, how you're supposed to act. I made one covenant with Abraham. You guys screwed that up. I made another covenant with Moses. You guys screwed that up. I had to send my only son down there to kick your butt and teach you stuff. Now it's, it's your job to go out and do it right. Yeah, yeah I was thinking. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so the, see, these people who've been studying the Old Testament, the salvation history, the New Testament, that when you do study the scriptures, you get a really good idea of how all this fits together. Exactly. It's been amazing. Uh, I, I'm just learning so much. It's just incredible. It really enlivens our faith, I think. Mm -hmm. Yep. How are we going to know the Holy Spirit if we don't study, if we don't come together in community, if we don't pray together? You know, this is what Jesus asked us to do. All of those things we're supposed to do as disciples, we need to be doing them. Right. Okay. Here I am, Lord. Yeah, here I am, Lord. <laughs> Oh, I really miss church. <laughs> okay, any other comments? You can all unmute yourself. We can just chat. I'll stop the recording. <laughs>